everyone. Welcome to this episode of Inspirational People. I'm Jason Scott Montoya, and today I get the awesome opportunity of introducing you to CRM Jedi Master, Alan Helms. Alan, say hello. Hello. <laughs> Alan and I got connected through the HubSpot user group here in Atlanta over the past several years as I became more integrated into the HubSpot marketplace. Alan is not just a HubSpot master, but also a Salesforce Jedi. He works with organizations to plan and grow their incoming volume of generated leads and closed deals. He also works his Jedi magic transitioning organizations to either Salesforce or HubSpot. And when necessary, he tames both systems to work effectively together, as well as the teams and people behind both the sales and marketing efforts of his clients. So Alan, thank you for taking the time to share your life with us today. Before I jump into our questions, Tell us about you, your story, and your work. Okay. Well, thanks, Jason. Uh, really, really glad to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah. So I think you did a great job with the introduction. Uh, you know, my comp I'm a CRM consultant specializing in, in HubSpot and Salesforce, as you mentioned, and my agency or my partnership really is, is called Organic Endeavors. And yeah. And as if you can tell, it, it comes from a, uh, a biological root name. It's uh, organic is the idea of something that's, that's growing or something that's mm -hmm. alive. And so that's what got me started in this was just the, the thought of if you go back to your high school biology, you know, what, what is it? What are the traits of being alive? What are the traits of, mm. of growing? And so we... Uh, and and would that be distinctly contrasted with... Um, uh, I don't know the right word, but essentially, what uh, um, what would be the opposite of organic in your mind in terms of how that applies in the business sense? That's a good question. I don't artificial know, or yeah, superficial. It, it, it would well, it would be you know something that's non-organic. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you think back, uh, you know, to to biology. And I can't even remember all the, the specific traits of, of, of uh, a living organism, but it was yeah. something that was able to reproduce. It was mm -hmm. something that was able to adapt um, and, and to its environment. Um, it was something that had the, uh, the biological components of homeostasis. So it's yeah. able to create a, a self-regulation mm -hmm. with its environment. So all of those things, uh, you know, being able to learn, to be able to adapt, to be able to grow, to be able to reproduce, all of those things are, are characteristics, biologically speaking, of a, uh, a living organism. And then, yeah. Of course, organic is the root word for organization, mm -hmm. right? So um, I was reading one day about uh, even proteins, and, you know, it fascinated me enough to, to read some about how different you know, how, how do different cells work together? How do different molecules work together and come together? Uh, because that's a, a lot of what we do in, in real life is just uh, pu putting different pieces together. Yeah. And there was a biological concept that was structure, uh, the structure of a protein determines a function, the function mm. of a protein. And yeah. so really, you know, you go, you're asking what, what makes a living organism different than a non-living organism? Well, carbon, uh, the, the carbon atom is considered to be one of the, the basics of a, a, the living structure. And then yeah. if you, the next step up from that are proteins. And so uh, the difference, the proteins are all the same. They're made mm -hmm. up of the same molecules, but it's how they're structured determines what function they have. Are they going to be, uh, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in what part of the muscular system yeah. or, or, or what part of the body are they going to reside in? And the same thing with DNA, right? DNA yeah. is the same chemical like a blueprint, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, yeah. how is it arranged? How is it organized? How does it connect it together yeah. that determines you for me, the, the, yeah. the uniqueness of people, right? Yeah. So w would you, would you say there's a difference between an organic business an organized business and an, a non-organic business, non-organized? And what would yep. that look like? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think part of it is having that, I'd say there's two things. One is having a purpose around it. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the concept of having something that's meaningful, something that, that provides value, that has a, a vision, uh, meaningful work. So I think you know, making a difference, all of those types of things from a almost a social science standpoint, yeah. And then I think the other part of it is the way we use the term organization most of the time, which is how do you organize your closet? Or do you want to yeah. put you know, your shirts mm -hmm. in a row and your pants in a row and your shoes yeah. on, the, on the right shelf? 
And so knowing where things are and how they fit and how mm -hmm. they're supposed to fit is going to differentiate yeah. an organized business from a non-organized business, which is really just chaos, right? Yeah. It's just, it's pure and I think what, variation. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing from you though is that um, it, there's no point in organizing your closet if it's not for some benefit, for some right. purpose. So right. just organizing it for the sake of, well, now it looks pretty, <laughs> but if it doesn't help you get your shoes or your clothes better, or it keeps things out of the way, or you don't fall when you trip, go into your closet, like there, that purpose, you know, that kind, of, that kind of struck me as a reminder when you said that. Yep. Yep. And so it goes back to uh, what, you know, is it, is there value in making your bed every morning? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. for some people there is, and maybe for some people there isn't. It, yeah. It, 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 it does depend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it depends on your situation and if you're right. living with someone and all kinds of other variables. So, so you're essentially helping people or organizations or dis, maybe we should say you're helping disorganizations become organizations. <laughs> yeah. It's, the, the idea behind it is is uh, to be able to work better together. Um, mm -hmm. And that's actually a tagline that I think HubSpot's using a lot as well, which is, uh, you know, if you're organized, you're able to work better together. And mm -hmm. that can mean, obviously, multiple different things. It depends on who's trying to work together. Yeah. In my case, it's a lot about getting sales and marketing and IT, the, the, the system, your sales and marketing systems. And that can be your technological stacks, it can be how you're defining your lead or sales process, anything that has to do with a company that wants to grow their revenue. Yeah. Because all of that should be organized around what the customer wants and how you're going to provide value to the customer. Okay. And so that's what comes back to the systems that I put in place, which are CRM, which stands for customer relationship management for those folks that don't know about it. And yeah. that's, that how are you organizing your customer relationships? And that gets into a funny question that a lot of people have is, you know, how do you measure a relationship? Um, yeah. How do you organize it? Um, mm. Those types of things. Yeah. So let's, let's rewind a moment. That that's what you're doing, who you're helping, what it looks like. Right. How did you get from elementary school, third grade, or you to, to, to now what you're doing? <laughs> yeah, it, it was a circuit. <laughs> did you uh, always think, man, I'm going to be a Salesforce and HubSpot guru? <laughs> no, I, I definitely backed into it. And yeah. it was after several failed attempts at finding other career paths that, uh, that I enjoyed, or really it was more of a process of elimination. Yeah. So I joke about it a lot of times and say uh, I'm, I'm really a recovering Salesforce system administrator. <laughs> I, I just backed into it. Um, and it was the, it was just and, something. And the trauma that, that as well. Is there, is there a lot of trauma that you have to reconcile? <laughs> not, not too much trauma, but you know, there's, there's some ups and downs uh, along the way, of course. Um, yeah. I, I was one of those guys that I, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up um, until really late in life when I, I, I jumped on the, the Salesforce bandwagon. Um, yeah. And what, what about you? When, when was that? Was that when Salesforce was kind of the thing? It was the hot thing? Not, the not, uh, it's funny. I can remember back when a, a friend of mine uh, back in 2003, when Salesforce had just gotten started and I worked for a company and they were one of the first clients of Salesforce. And this was yeah. like three user interfaces ago, way, way, way back. And, yeah. um, and he's like, Alan, man, if I were you, I'd, I'd jump in this and then become a Salesforce consultant. This thing's going to be big. And I ignored him for uh, about five years. Yeah. But then jumped into it around 2008 uh, and took a job as a Salesforce system administrator at a company and learned a little bit about it. Yeah. And then proceeded with getting certified. And then that that's what got me started on, on my way. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because... In, in a similar way, you know, with a HubSpot, I didn't seek it out. I just had a client that hired me and said, I use HubSpot, you know, I'd use it. And I said, no, but I bet you I could figure it out. And, you know, I, I did. And so, <laughs> so yeah, it's, I embraced it and then learned it and mastered it. So, exactly. so yeah. So, okay. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit. And, you know, we're in the middle of this crisis. It's a pandemic, but it also has economic uh, consequences and we're there's a lot of uncertainty and we're trying to navigate this in our personal and work lives you know what is your advice to us on, on how we should be looking at it and how we can respond to it in a wise way 
That's a good question. I, I don't know that I have all the answers to it. I, I probably take a little bit more of a philosophical approach to it. Um, yeah. a, a longer term approach. It, it, um, it's, it's an interesting dilemma for America and Americans. Yeah. And, um, it, we're so used to being in control of mm. most of our lives, um, in a lot of ways. And, uh, we're, we're used to overcoming every obstacle that seems to be thrown our way. Um, yeah. So this one is a little different. And then, then generationally, uh, I mean, we're getting to the point where, you know, uh, you know, fo folks born at the end of, of World War II, I mean, it's been a pretty nice run where America hasn't had to deal with a world war, mm -hmm. hasn't had to deal with a, a pandemic, hasn't had to deal with a major economic collapse. Um, yeah. Had some minor bumps, but, uh, you know, it's, it, makes me wonder, I mean, how, how long, you know, will, will the gravy train last? Because we, we've had it good for, for a long time, yeah. if you look at it from a very high level. So it's... Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, you know, you talk about that idea um, of, you know, what comes to my mind is uh, the movie Infinity War, Avengers Infinity War. The beginning of the movie, these just like godlike heroes are facing the villain Thanos and they are just crushed. And he says something like, you know, I, I understand how you feel because I know what it's like to have, to feel like you have no control over the right. situation. Yep. And, um, and so here, as Americans, I think we, we think of ourselves as uh, this caricature of this hero of the world, you know, and here we are sort of bending on our knees, crushed by the pandemic in ways that we just were not prepared for <laughs> mentally yeah. or, or physically. Yeah. It, and it's, it's interesting because it infringes on, it's not just about us and an independent decision that we have to make in a lot of cases, right? I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's a virus and, and we can spread it. And so, you know, simply going to the grocery store could, you yeah. know, there's always that conversation of where, where my rights begin and where another person mm -hmm. writes in. Yeah. And we, we, feel kind like of selflessness we can put most of it in that box, but I don't know, you know, this is one of those situations where I don't know that you can. Um, yeah, it's a complex. <laughs> very complicated. <laughs> but right? we want, we've, we've been operating too simplistically in a lot of ways, I think is what I'm hearing from you. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we love to fall back on the cliches and, you know, just take it one day at a time or, yeah. you know, do the best with what we've got. And, yeah. And, <laughs> If you can, you know, some yeah. things you can't address, they're not binary. They're not, mm -hmm. you know, a one-to-one -one relationship. It's so, a spectrum. Yeah. yeah. It, it kind of reminds me, um, like you mentioned the idea of working together. Um, in a sense, you know, I've, I've, I've seen this meme before where the parent, the kids are like fighting. So the parent just duct tapes them together and says, you're stuck until you figure out how to work together. <laughs> and I kind of feel like that's our situation, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then just all the stories how, uh, you know, uh, wife swap or any of these types of scenarios where oh, you're yeah. forced to live with somebody or something uh, that's much different than how you were raised or, or, or grown up with or what you expected. I mean, a lot of times I, I feel like life in a way is um, – that there's really two things that happen. You, you, you enter, enter life or you get to a point in life and, and uh, you, you look back and you go, either everything turned out the way I wanted it to and something's mm -hmm. still missing yeah. or else, of course, everything didn't turn out the way I wanted it to and obviously something's missing. But either yeah. way, there, there seems to be something missing and it, it's frustrating when you yeah. can't figure out what it is. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I remember the story. I think it was Deion Sanders after he won the Super Bowl. Um, yeah. He felt more empty and lonely than ever. And, and he ended up becoming a Christian like immediately after that as a result, just because he, he realized that that the monumental success wasn't enough. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and, and I guess on the flip side, you know, this idea of expectations that I think we all we all have them and, and it's, we sort of expect life to happen a certain way and that we should arrive at a certain place. And, that it should look a certain way. And, and, and maybe even if that was happening at a broad level, this pandemic has crushed a lot of our dreams and changed things and our plans. And, 
and it's thrown it uh, all into a, a blender of uncertainty <laughs> for sure. Yeah. 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 So, things and, yeah, I remember, you know, I've, I've been traveling before and I, I remember one day when I was just traveling with my sister, uh, actually, I think we were on a train in Spain or I was trying to arrange the train schedule and I had in my mind that, you know, this train arrived at this station and we had just enough time for this connection to mm. be made and then we would catch the next train and then if the whole series of events went well i felt great about it oh, but okay. then of course one day when something didn't work mm. um we had to come up with option b and we yeah. ended up walking across the street and exploring this just amazing beautiful park in and uh i believe it was in madrid and that wasn't on our itinerary at all and and so you find these unexpected joys or something pops yeah. up that you weren't aware of and wasn't in your itinerary and you would have missed that if everything mm -hmm. had gone according to plan yeah and i think what i'm hearing from you is that sometimes our what what we could experience is is better than what we plan to experience or what you know th there's unexpected beneficial surprises that could come out of this correct yeah, yeah. you said so, it better than i did yeah, yeah. So what what does it mean, like, when you think about just living and working during this season of life, I mean, what does it look like to do that well? Well, do you mean when season of life, do you mean at, at my age or do you mean <laughs> during the coronavirus? Or, well, uh, may, maybe it's uh, the fusion of both, but, but yeah. yeah, just, I guess, the season, both in terms of your life and, and the season that we as a globe are, um, are facing, you know, this conflict. Um, I, I don't know what to say completely about the coronavirus yet because, you know, we just don't know. And I mean, we really are learning something new every day. And I think mm -hmm. we're, you know, every state, every country is trying a, a slightly different approach. So in, in one sense, it's fascinating if you, if you can, if you're able to take a step back and you haven't, uh, uh, you know, been personally affected by it, which, you know, a lot of people have. I've been fortunate that I haven't had too many people close by uh, be affected by it. So if you're able to take a step back, it's an interesting story and innovation and how people are trying different approaches and some will succeed mm. and some will fail. And again, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow as Americans that don't like to fail. Um, and, and how do you deal with failure in, in mm. certain ways and, and the, the desire to blame others uh, when something fails. Um, and it's, it's really hard when there is so much out of your control, you're, you're naturally drawn to, to blaming something else. So it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic to watch that play out. Um, yeah. You know, and people trying to, you know, the, the, the key words that we keep hearing, you probably heard a lot in marketing and sales is to, you know, to try be, and be empathetic with your, your customers and, and to try and, you know, go alongside them in this and, and not try to sell too many things. But at the same time, people are still trying to, you still have to work to, to try and make some money. So it's, it's, it can be a, a survival mentality. And how do you make all that work when, when people are trying to survive? And so yeah. it's, it's a, it's a tough situation. Um, you know, it's, I think we're gonna have to live with this for mm -hmm. you know probably six to twelve to eighteen months and and yeah. figuring it out. So how do we deal with that failure that you're describing and and the fact that maybe even the failure isn't in our control at all and and how do we not blame? How do we, what's an alternative for us? I I don't have all the answers on that. <laughs> um, you know it. it I. I, for me, I have to have another level involved in this, that it, it, it's above and beyond my pay grade, so to speak, whereas, um, you know, there's obviously decisions being made about the economy that I have no control over. And so, mm -hmm. you, again, you, some of it is falling into the cliches, you know, I, I can only <laughs> control what I can control and, and, and things like that. But that's a simplistic way of of saying that you hope and think that there's something else out there that's driving this and the uh as they say the general bent of history is toward toward good um and so you know my my uh my dad always had a term called uh redeeming value and he'd mm -hmm. always ask if we were going to go see a movie or 
you know, go take part in an activity that he wasn't especially interested in doing because he was not a big movie buff. Um, yeah. He would, he would ask, you know, what, what's the redeeming value? Mm -hmm. And that, that always resonated with me because it's, you know, there's something else out there that, you know, we're supposed to move through this to transform ourselves and that there's a exterior force at work that is trying to, uh, make us question some things that we weren't questioning two months ago, uh, make us experience something, uncertainty, fear that we weren't experiencing two months ago, um, force us into a, a new type of relationship with someone that we weren't in a relationship with uh, a couple yeah. of months ago. Um, there's a lot of things there that stretch us uh, and mold us into becoming different people. And so you know, I like to have a more of an optimistic approach there and, 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 you know, look at it as a, an adventure, so to speak, and something yeah. that we can, can work through together. So what is it about us that resists that adventure that you're speaking of that we, that we resist? Um, why does it take a crisis to do those things you just, just you listed off there? <laughs> well, um, you know, we get, we get lazy, we get into a certain, uh, rote, uh, Mm. Uh, comfort autopilot. Level. Yeah, where, where we do get on autopilot for a while uh, and then we just don't think about it. I think we, we sleepwalk through a lot of it. So I, I think that's part of it. But I mean, you know, there, there's a basic aspect of humanity that doesn't like uncertainty. Mm. Um, and, and I think, you know, we've got enough of a, you know, we've we're built a, as a immortal in the sense that we want something better um, and we want to see a result and we're in we're stuck in this paradox as, as humans where we're living it out and we know that something's going to happen and we know that there is cause and effect at play but we don't want to enter into a situation unless we know the end result i mean it's just it's 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 yeah. paper that way and so we're, we're geared for for safety in a lot of ways so it, it's it's hard it's uncomfortable to to do that so i guess what would you recommend for us instead of blaming whether it's the government or something else what can we do instead with that energy to, to, for a productive reason yeah, I mean, I, the, probably the best advice I got from a, a friend of a, a month or so back is just, you know, to go out there and try and do something for someone else other than yourself. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it, you can, you know, again, we, we go back to the cliches, you can't control what you can't control, you know, and you say, well, I can't control a political environment that we're in. Um, but you, you can, we all have influence. So, I mean, it, it, if you want to take that to its logical extreme, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can go uh, and, and start a, a, a movement of sorts if you mm -hmm. wanted to start a movement of sorts. If you wanted to go and, and petition something or run for office or, or uh, go and picket a, 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 a government building to get your, your, your viewpoint out there. I mean, there, you can go as, take it as far as you want to take it, uh, to, to exert some influence. So I think it's finding something where you feel like you can have a positive effect on it instead of um, just sitting and, and marinating in it. I mean, mm. that's probably what a lot of people say, but it's just sometimes, you know, you have to turn the news off. You have to turn uh, and you have to go outside and go for a walk um, yeah. and, 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 and try and talk to some friends and, and just call somebody up and, and enjoy the, the personal relationships that you have and, and, remind folks that you're doing it together. And that, I think that's ultimately the result of this is, is, you know, we're, again, we're in it together, another yeah. cliche, but I mean, <laughs> we are, and we've got to figure all that out. And there's, there's value in that. There's re yeah. redeeming value in doing mm. it. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, when we think about the situation, it's, it's one thing for us to kind of, um, you know, mature and, and reflect and grow through it. But there is a responsibility that, that I think that we have in helping others do the same and, and to give them a hand up and to inspire them and to teach and to reassure. So what would you say about that idea of mentorship in helping others and, and what does that look like and how do we do that? How do we go about that? Uh, it's a good, good question. Um, 
you know, I, I think I think you've just got to rub elbows with a lot of folks and, and try and tune in to the situation that's presented to you. Um, yeah. It's, uh, someone was talking to me a, a while back about, you know, uh, you know, if you, you know, what would you pray about or, mm -hmm. you know, what would you ask about if you're, you're praying for something? And they said, well, have you, you know, have you ever tried a, a listening prayer? And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know what that is. Um, but the, the, the idea is to just say, I'm, I'm going to sit in quiet for a little while. And that's an extreme example, but, you know, meditate or, or sit in extreme quiet and, and, and let some things come to you. Yeah. And so that's just one example. I mean, I think you've, You've got to be, try and be aware, um, increase your awareness of where you're at with different people and listen to conversations um, uh, and find ways to, to, you know, always look for ways to, to help and, and find ways to help in, in every situation, whether that's going through the grocery store line or, you know, I just had a conversation with a, a friend that I hadn't talked to in a while and, uh, you know, we we started getting sidetracked on all this political stuff and then we needed to pull it back and, and learn about what's really going on in each other's lives. And so, mm. yeah, we could have gotten sidetracked into a, a political back and forth, but it sometimes it's better to pull back and find out what's, what's really going on in somebody's life so you can be sensitive to it. So mm. I think that's it. You've got to be intentional about it. I mean, you, you've, you, you, you've got to want to help some other folks and be intentional about set some time aside and go out and try and try and help some people and, and give them an opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I like, I like that. Um, and just the idea of, um, reception versus not, not just pushing out, but also to receive whether it's listening in a prayer or listening to somebody. Um, and just, just the power that that can have in terms of connecting us as well as allowing us. There's a great Ted talk called shut up and listen. Um, it's one of my favorites, but he, he tells a story about how they went to, I think it was South Africa or some African country. Uh, I guess I didn't listen well cause I don't remember, but um, anyway, he, he, they went in and they, they planted these farms on, across the river and did all this great work for this community. And the hippopotamuses at a certain point in the year, they came out of the river and they just ate, everything destroyed all of it and so they the people that did it they talked to the natives they're like did you guys know about this and we said yeah and they said well why didn't you tell us and they said we well, never asked <laughs> so that was the idea of this ted talk is that often we just go try and do something and it's not even done it's done in a way that's not going to be helpful um or it's going to be destroyed in, in that case so um, perhaps they could have done the very same thing, but in a different way that would have benefited everyone instead of the, just the hippopotamuses. <laughs> right. And, then, and, and so what do you do? I mean, you were asking earlier about failure. Um, yeah. So if that's a failure, I mean, how do you mm. approach that? Yeah. Um, so do you go back and try and blame somebody else? Do you, you know, it's not even a good idea to blame yourself overly uh, because yeah. you can get, wrapped up in that and it's mm -hmm. at some point in time you've got to assess what what went wrong and and try and and, and make a, a change the next time and build yeah. it farther okay. away from the hippo um <laughs> yeah and uh, dale carnegie talks about allowing people to save face so if you were the guy that screwed up you know hopefully your boss would say you know what yep. it, it happens let's let's learn from it and make make it better uh, make it better next time exactly so so let's talk about stories. You know, the narratives shape how we see the world. We're creatures that love to consume stories, fiction, nonfiction, movies, TV, books. What, what's some, what, what's a story that's, uh, or a parable or experience that's shaped you and in your own life? Hmm. But we're both uh, Star Wars fans, so I imagine that's one for sure that's, that's shaped us both in a variety of ways. <laughs> it does, uh, you know, and, and I love Star Wars. Um, but I, I'd say that the real science fiction in my mind um, is comfortable because I can carve it out as not being a, a reality in some sense. Mm. Um, and so I almost see it more of a, an escape. Yeah. Even though there, there can be parallels, right? You're going to have yeah. heroes and, and, and uh, 
overcoming obstacles and, and mm -hmm. redemption and things like that. But I, the ones that really get to me are the ones that are really personal. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do love movies. I like watching movies. I'm not really a movie buff, but I, that's a, a form of entertainment that I like. And it's a form of telling a story that I just think is really, really powerful. And so yeah, I've always loved the movies about um, or stories about an underdog mm -hmm. that is you know, trying to come back or has reached the end of his or her rope. Yeah. And, and um, you know, going all the way back to, you know, uh, it's a wonderful life, the, the Christmas movie where, you know, the guys thinking, yeah. you know, well, the world would be better off without me and I'm, I'm worth more dead than alive. Yeah. And it's a black and white, you know, 1940s movie with Jimmy Stewart. And it's, you know, <laughs> it's talking about suicide and, yeah. and, and, you know, a lot of us have been there. So that, that one, that'll, that'll get me to cry every Christmas, even, even now. Um, and some old movies uh, similar to that, uh, Ben Hur's another movie. Yeah. Um, where, uh, again, he had certain expectations in his life and something mm. happened and it, it crushed him. Yeah. And uh, how did, how did he get turned around in, in, in his life and, and, and uh, how did he decide or move from having a life of vengeance and hatred to, to moving toward a life of, of love and forgiveness. And yeah, that, that redemptive story is powerful. Um, you know, I can go on and on about all the different movies um, that, that, uh, that I think have affected me. Um, and then there's, you know, I think there's just personal stories that, you know, if we think of ourselves as actors in a ongoing narrative yeah. or an ongoing story, uh, I enjoy thinking of it in that way because we're, we're writing our story. Um, you know, you go back in, even to root words of, of the, the word authority is an author. And mm. if there's some authorship going on uh, that, that gives breath and life, you're talking about inspiration that's breathing into something. And I, I like to think about how these words are, are defined sometimes and how they're formed and inspire mm. means to breathe into something. And, yeah. and give it give it life again it's that organic concept and and so you know there's just different stories uh about it and everybody's got one and that's what's beautiful and if you can respect everyone um as having a story and and how valuable it is for them to have a story and you to be a part of that story i, I think that's a fun concept that's what i yeah. enjoy thinking about so tell me a little bit more about the idea of self-authorship what does that mean and and how do we lean into that because i think often we can we can be the participant of someone else's story but we, yet we're not authoring our own story and i know that we can't control everything but but we can still author things so dive in deeper on that yeah it's it's fascinating because you know again we've got control over some things and some things we don't have control over um i think for me it's just uh, the idea of being a created being um resonates with me and being created for a reason and for a, a purpose yeah and and, and trying to connect with that but then also if i was created then there's something outside of me that that created me there was a an origin or a cause mm -hmm. that, that that happened before me yeah um, and you know i i made no choice in, in whether or not i was born or not but again i was given a certain set of skills a certain situation a certain family certain opportunities and you know i i get to be part of that painting uh, that that's being painted, um, yeah. and you know I get to be pushed around on on somebody's campus, uh, campus, uh, <laughs> campus. Yeah, uh, but it it's and I'll have a, a place in that final picture. Yeah, uh, and I'll have a unique color and be part of a, a, a unique uh, visual in that that uh, story or painting. Um, but it's still being played out and I, I get to have control over that. I, I get to respond to it in, in a certain yeah. way. I get to reflect, uh, the, uh, the pigments in me get to reflect <laughs> a certain light, um, yeah. based on, on who's, who's looking at my, my story or my life. And so yeah. 
I don't know if that answers it, but that's sort of the way I look at it. Mm. And do you think as, as life has, uh, tr as you've traversed it from a young age to now, that, that you're more of a intentional participant in that painting versus a, more of a, I, guess, I don't know if victim's the right word, but just a. Yeah, I had, I had to be humbled a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, and, and hopefully I, I guess I'll continue to be humbled a lot because I, you know, just I, I was reading a book where it talks about you're, you're given certain what he called Sam Keen, where he talks about the myths of, of you know, becoming a man or, or, or becoming a, a person. And that is something you struggle with because you're given, you know, th this code or this performance checklist on what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman or what it means to be an American, all of these types of recipes that you're supposed to fulfill. And you've just got to get there and, and play it out. Um, mm -hmm. And he said that, uh, you know, the, we, we reach a point of despair at some point in time when we're trying to be something that someone else has given us, uh, a recipe that someone else has given us. And Ultimately, we've got to find our, our own recipe and how, how the ingredients get mixed together. And so that's, you know, that's helpful for me to, to figure that out. Um, I, I've just always struggled with wanting to know how things are going to work before I start. Okay. Start um, and that probably explains why I've never gotten married, because I want to know how it's going to turn out mm. um, before I jump into it. Yeah. Um, and so everybody's got a different journey to, to, to figure that out. Um, mm. Yeah. It's like a, my wife used to read books and she'd read the last pages of the book before she decided if she would read it. <laughs> right. And, and, and I mean, in our line of work, we're supposed to even design blogs so that people can do that. So that people yeah. can up to the end and, and jump around and, and, and take what they want. And, yeah, and that's it. I mean, people just it's, life's not linear the way we want it to be linear all the time, and and so it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. So let's let's shift a little bit. Talk. So we talked about stories and narratives and authorship. Let's talk about systems, whether they're technical or human. We're all parts of and creators of systems, and these systems direct and inform how we think and act, whether it's personal or work or business. So tell me about systems and, and how do you think of them and how do you look at them and how do they play a part and how do you play your part? Well, the, it, it just became clear to me at some point in time where that, that systematic thinking makes a lot of sense to me because there are, again, things are not just binary, binary if then causes. It's not a two plus two equals four world. That things are, are complicated and it's a, usually an out, al, it's, it's usually more about algebra or calculus than it is pure arithmetic. And so yeah. I think things are just more complicated and it's, you know, all the things that we've talked about, how do you take part in being part of a whole, but yet an individual part of a whole and yeah. then being able to influence other things, but not have full control over them. And, yeah. and you know, I, I've just had to accept that there's a lot of paradoxes in this life where two things can be equally true at the same time. And, and even in uh, contrary, to each other. I mean, you know, how can the first be last? How can, um, uh, you know, we be uh, immortal and mortal at the same time? Um, how can, um, you know, we, we have free will, but predestination uh, yeah. working in, in conjunction with each other? And there's, there's something holding all of that. I mean, how are we, we're sitting here and yet we're moving a million miles an hour through space. Um, yeah. it's just, you're still, but you're moving at the same time. And I, I mean, there's just so many different paradoxes that are unresolved that I just latch onto that concept and 
approach it in probably a sense of wonder. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just, I had to take a step back and say, I'm not going to figure it out. I'm not going to know how everything, the result is going to be to everything. And to me that that's humbling because it's, again, if you take the root word, it, it's, uh, it means the ground, the, the, the soil and getting close mm -hmm. to the ground. And so um, you, you have to be humbled uh, mm -hmm. and understand that it's not always about me. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can take that step back, it gives me that sense of wonder and I can start to appreciate it because it's literally magic. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of ways. And, yeah. and to be in awe of the magic can be a, a fun childlike place to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to remind myself to go back to that, that place every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So how do, how would that, how does that wonder help us now in this crisis or does it? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, again, it's like that, uh, <laughs> the quote out of the, the movie Rudy, where, uh, you know, he's been trying to make the, uh, the football team at, at Notre Dame and, and, uh, or, or get into school at Notre Dame over and over and over again. And he keeps going to the priest to, to give him advice. And the priest comes back to him and says, um, you know, I've, I've found that there's two certainties in life. There is a God and I'm not him. And so, <laughs> You know, that's, again, it's it's sort of that humility that you, for me, if I can take a step back and realize that uh, it's going to work out okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. again, that's kind of a trite phrase, but there's something bigger going on mm -hmm. that I don't have control over. Uh, and, and in my personal faith, it's a benevolent power. And so yeah. it's a power of, of, of love. I, I just feel like, you know, love conquers hate, uh, good conquers evil. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, lo love beats the spread, so to speak. And in, in, yeah. in the, I mean, there's just, there's just a, a the, the game sort of rigged, uh, in the end for it to, to work out well, uh, for me or my spirit as, as I, I journey along the way. And so that's um, just having that comfort. Uh, it could be a crutch in some ways, but that's the crutch that I, I, I want to have. I want to have faith in, in, in leaning on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. So, you know, life can be hard and difficult and I often feel like it's unfair, challenging. But at the same time, like you said, it could be times of wonder and, and awe and joy and prosperity. So as we traverse through this journey we call life, you know, what parting words of wisdom would you share with us? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think one of the most, um, probably a couple things. Um, I, I was re reading recently where, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis was uh, talking about um, what kind of people do we want to be and what kind of people are we drawn toward becoming. And, he, and uh, he, he's just got this funny, very practical way of defining it and saying, um, you know, it's usually, you know, when you run across people that um, seems, seem to want to love you more but need you less, um, and and people that um, seem to have an infinite amount of time uh, that they get and 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 make themselves available to you. Um, you know, how do you find people like that that you're drawn toward that um, that that you know just seem to seem to have that it factor. Um, mm -hmm. So what, you know, what does that mean? So I think it's finding that out. Um, and I think for me in my life, one thing that, that I keep coming back to is, is um, uh, the Apostle Paul, when he was writing a letter to the uh, Philippians, um, he talks about um, uh, uh, what kind of attitude uh, that, that uh, folks should have. And he said, have, have an attitude in yourself the same that, that Jesus had. Mm -hmm. who, even though he existed in the form of God, yeah. did not regard equality as God, as something mm -hmm. to, to be grasped and held on to, but instead uh, emptied himself out 
becoming obedient as, as a servant. Mm -hmm. And, and that's always resonated with me because if I was, you know, I'm always looking for things to hold on to. And yeah. what if I just, and it wasn't the way it's phrased is, is he did not even regard. So if you're, you're thinking about that, if you didn't regard, you had to chance your God, you're existing with God, you're part of the Trinity. Uh, and yet I'm not going to reach out and take advantage of that. And I'm not even going to regard that. It's, mm. it's not even a choice I made. Yeah. It's part it's, of the character. Yes. It's it just, it doesn't even occur to me because I don't evaluate things. Mm. I've got a different mathematics going yeah. on. Yeah. It just does not add up or it doesn't equate to me. So how do you get to that point of transcendence where you don't even regard the ultimate being as something to hold on to, but instead just let it go and open up. Um, yeah. That's powerful to me. And I, I'll never be able to walk away from that. Yeah. The kind of the visual that I maybe comes to mind is like, we're, we don't necessarily need to hold on because he's already holding us. And so it's like, if my kid was like holding on to me and I'm trying to hold him, it just makes it more difficult. If you just let go and let me hold him, we both have a better experience but we have that struggle with trust. Do we trust him? Yep. Yep. And, and we, we have to make that choice. I mean, just, I guess the way we're built, we, we, we have to just make a decision. Yeah. It, it just blows me away that it's not even a decision making criteria mm -hmm. for him. Um, so that's, yeah. Cause in our flesh, in the way that we think in our own inclinations as humans, when we have authority and power, it's so that we can use that. And it's rather backwards to say that I have all this power and authority and yet I'm not going to use it. I'm going to, I'm not even going to think to use it in the sense of take advantage of you, but I'm actually going to serve you um, instead. And so that's, it's a very polar opposite to, to a lot of what humans tend to do, the more power that they get. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. So is there anything else you wanted to share that you didn't get a chance to, or that I didn't ask about, or that you felt compelled to, to share? No, with us? no, I think this has been great. I've, been, I've enjoyed talking with you and, and uh, it's been a fun exercise to go through this and, and think through some of the, the deeper questions that, that you're asking. So I appreciate you taking yeah. the time. Yeah, I feel like I, I know you so much better now, just from this little yeah. chat, you know. It's a little bit of therapy. Yeah, yeah. So tell us how people can connect with you. You know, what, what are you doing online and what are you up to and how can they find you? How can they connect with you? Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm not crazy active online. I, I try to stay in LinkedIn for business. So people are, are welcome to, to find me. And, you know, I've got a, a cute little get up there uh, at the moment for uh, <laughs> being a CRM Jedi. So yeah, you can look for me as uh, Alan Helms, a CRM Jedi on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. And then I've of course, you can come to our website, which is organicendeavors.com. And mm -hmm. um, other than that, that's, uh, you know, call me or email me. If you've got my, my digits and, and uh, got my email address, feel free to reach out. All right. Well, that sounds great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure.